Hi, everyone, and welcome to NGVA Europe's inaugural edition of Jens Talks Business. My name is Karen Romer. I'm the SVP Communications at Hexagon Group, the proud guest presenters of today's webcast. How to level the playing field for biomethane and effectively install a viable decarbonization strategy for transportation is today's topic. I'll moderate today's broadcast from a studio here in Lincoln, Nebraska, where a major hexagon U.S. manufacturing facility is located. Dr. Jens Andersen, the Secretary General of NGVA Europe, and for whom the series is named, will host today's talk from his office in Brussels. My colleague, Ashley Remillard, VP Legal, will join us from her home office in Costa Mesa, California. And Eric Bippis, SVP Global Sales, is here by my side at Inspire Media in Lincoln. A truly global hybrid event today. The agenda for today's webcast includes introduction by Jens, a presentation by Team Hexagon, Eric and Ashley, um, discussions then, which will be led by Jens, and then audience participation in that discussion, and then a wrap up. By audience participation, we mean you. You have an opportunity to shape the discussion. So please don't be shy. You can see the Q&A field below your screen. It'll be open, it will be open throughout the broadcast. So feel free to use it throughout the presentation. And if you have any trouble accessing the Q&A field, you can send your question to ir at hexagongroup.com. I now invite Jens to take the floor. Jens. Thank you very much, uh, Karen. Thank you really very much. I'm pleased uh, to announce now this uh, new series of talks. Um, and we are starting now with Jens Talks Business. We are just coming out of the uh, COP26 discussion. We uh, are in the middle of the Fit for 55 package and we are ahead of a new legislation also for the uh, heavy duty sector. There's much to do and this is the reason why we have to talk business. And looking at Europe, we have to look at uh, all the technological possibilities we have to, in order to reduce uh, carbon dioxide emissions and greenhouse gas emissions. And we all have learned from COP26 that we have to keep as close as possible to the Paris 1.5 degrees target. And this is why we have to make use of all technologies that are sensible and uh, already available and can instantly, because time matters, can instantly help us in reducing greenhouse gas emissions in order to save the climate. And on the other hand, we have also several requests from uh, our members of the association, but also from uh, outside of, of uh, other uh, uh, non-members that there is a need in order to, there's a need to, to bring companies together and develop new business cases, new solutions in order to, to form, to shape this uh, transformation we have in our industry. This is the, the heaviest uh, transformation since the uh, invention of the automobile itself. Yeah, and um, after this uh, short discussion, of course, we will continue not only with uh, Jens Talks Business, we will also do uh, uh, um, uh, talks about uh, politics and also talk about technology. But today, together with Hexagon, we are talking about business and I'm really excited that I'm doing this together with the team of Hexagon, because I find this uh, company is, is pushing high-tech European engineering further. They have that uh, really interesting technological solution we can make use of instantly. And this is uh, why I'm really excited uh, that we are doing this together. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, thanks right now already for, for, uh, to the team at Hexagon. And um, now I um, have the pleasure to take over, to give over to, um, uh, to Eric. He will give us some very interesting information about the prospects we have with biomethane and transportation. Eric, please. Great, thank you, Jens. Thank you, I just wanna say on behalf of Hexagon Composites, thank you very much for inviting us to this first event. Uh, we're very excited to be here and we're very passionate about uh, the growth of biomethane, renewable natural gas across the European market, but also the North American market. And we want to share with you some of our findings. So with that, I'll jump right into it. First off, from a hexagon composite standpoint, we don't believe that clean air is a privilege. We believe it's absolutely everyone's right. And it's not only everyone's right in North America and Europe, 
but globally. And we truly have a global footprint and a, and a passion and drive to drive energy transformation around the world. When we take a look at our global footprint, we have manufacturing locations in North America and in Europe. We have sales and engineering based out of North America and Europe as well. Um, and our goal is to, do, to serve our end customers, both the fleet that is actually operating the vehicles, but also the OEMs that are putting the product onto the streets, support them in market with in market capability. And our two core markets are the North American market, the European market, but we also have uh, a strong footprint growing into Asia as well. So when we look at the business, we look at Hexagon Group, and we specifically focus on the mobility sector, there's two businesses that focus on either G-Mobility, which would be Hexagon Agility, focusing on compressed natural gas solutions, type four composite cylinders, renewable natural gas, biogas solutions for the commercial vehicle space, and that's our G-Mobility, our low emissions uh, business. Hexagon Purus is our zero emission, uh, e-mobility solutions and that's focusing on complete BEV solutions, integrated solutions for heavy duty truck, medium duty truck, as well as complete hydrogen solutions for passenger car right on up through commercial vehicle, including type four cylinders as well as systems. So now what do we do? When we look at the actual vehicle, the purpose of today's conversation is really gonna be focusing on heavy duty transport, the big emitter per vehicle which is where Hexagon Agility and Purus spend most of their time in the marketplace. And we've spent a lot of time over the last 15 years working with fleets to understand what is the duty cycle of their vehicle, what problem are they trying to solve by going to a clean energy solution and reducing their carbon footprint, but they still have a business to run. So when we look at the product that we manufacture, we're vertically integrated, our core competency is type four composite cylinders that we manufacture in Europe and out of Germany, Norway, as well as the US. We take those composite cylinders and they can be to contain gaseous uh, energy from natural gas, renewable natural gas, hydrogen gas, um, from 200 bar right on up to 700 bar applications. And then we take those cylinders and we package them in efficient storage system. So what you see in the upper left <clears throat> is an example of a type four si cylinders that are put into either a hydrogen system or a natural gas or renewable natural gas system for packaging on a vehicle. And this is an example of a back of cab system. We also have rail mount systems for European type designs. And then the third area that we've really expanded to in the last three or four years is on the BEV, the pure BEV side, and that's around battery pack technology, complete heavy duty and medium duty vehicle integration of integrated systems um, from front to back, the um, accessory drives right on through the electric drivetrain. And together, if you look back over the last 10 years, we have over 70,000 alternate fuel vehicles on the road today, primarily in the commercial vehicle space. So when we look at the sense of urgency, and Ashley's gonna to talk to you a little bit about the different regulations that are taking place, and we just came off a of COP26 where global leaders came together to talk about what are we gonna to do to reduce emissions over the next 10 years, 15 years, and 20 years. But the good news is there's a sense of urgency around 2025 and 2030 saying, if we can't hit certain milestones by these dates, our ability to hit it by 2040 or 2050 is gonna be severely impacted. So when we look at the transportation sector, we know that transportation is responsible for almost 20% of CO2 emissions globally. When you look at the commercial vehicle space, and now we, we narrow it down to the European market, on average in a non-COVID year, there's roughly 300,000 commercial vehicles, heavy duty vehicles that go into the market every year. And as of 2020, unfortunately, almost 97%, 96.4% of those were still diesel vehicles. So in order for us to hit that 2030 target of a 30% reduction, we need action and we need action now and we need to deployable in mass, not small science projects waiting for a technology to come on board. So for the, once again, for the purpose of today's conversation, we're gonna talk about the commercial vehicle space. And what we're trying to illustrate here is the fact that we have an agnostic approach to clean energy solutions at Hexagon. We don't believe, my sales team, when they go in and talk to a fleet or they talk to an OEM, we get asked all the time, what is the solution that we should go with? Should we go with EV? Should we go with hydrogen? Should we deploy natural gas now? And our answer is yes, you should do everything right now because there's clean energy solutions that are available today to deploy in mass 
with a positive TCO as some of the other technologies come on board, as infrastructure comes into place, as electrical goods turn on to produce clean, green electricity, green hydrogen, that does not mean we can wait right now. And what we've done here is to illustrate, when you look at the European park and you segregate it between light commercial vehicle, medium duty truck and heavy duty truck, we believe, and this is a, actually a, a study that was done by a third party, that in the light duty vehicle space, LCV, lower range, BEV makes absolute sense. In many cases, it's returned to base, you plug it in overnight and it charges. When you start to go into longer haul and you start to get into heavy payloads, that's where the story changes very, very quickly because the energy consumption of those applications is extremely high. And today as we stand here and looking out into the future into 2030, the absolute best solution that we see on the marketplace that has the infrastructure to support it is natural gas. And there's an evolution in there that we're excited to tell you about as well. Now let's quantify, so as we look at this, this particular uh, illustration and we look at long haul, we look at heavy duty truck in that lower right hand quadrant, that's where today liquid natural gas, compressed natural gas, biogas, fuel cell vehicles in the future as infrastructure comes on board, that's where they will play the most and we're seeing that today already with natural gas. So quantifying what this means in the European market, we already identified that there's approximately 300,000 vehicles in the European market that go into the market every year. Of those, there was 20, in 2019, the CO2 mandate for heavy duty fleet vehicle emissions really targeted that long haul application. So if you look at the sleeper four by two, the sleeper six by two rigid, the sleeper six by two tractor, it's those vehicles that compromise about 225 vehicles per year that we're targeting for natural gas solutions today. And in fact, if we look globally, the fastest adopting market in the Western world is the European truck with natural gas. So why are we excited? Once again, this was a study that, that we commissioned a few months back to look at natural gas adoption, hydrogen adoption in the global marketplace and say, what, do, what should we expect through 2025 and even 2030? But if we take a short term view and say, okay, we have to have a milestone by 2025, what could this market look like based on the regulations that we're seeing come in place? You can see that we're expecting the potential of a 4X growth of compressed natural gas demand and the bulk of that you can see is in the heavy duty truck space. So with that, and we look at the European marketplace, the biggest opportunity we have right now is around biomethane. And I'm gonna describe that a little bit. So I'm gonna use this term synonymously back and forth, biomethane or RNG, renewable natural gas. But let me explain what biomethane is. Biomethane is really the methane molecule, which is the same whether it's a phos from fossil fuel or derived from biomass. But biomethane is, uh, produced from manure, can be landfill waste, agricultural waste, wastewater sludge. The bulk of the available waste that's out there is agricultural, around 60% of the available waste. And it's specifically designed or processed to be used in commercial vehicles. So RNG is methane produced from biogas certified for use in, in heavy duty vehicles. Now what's exciting is the negative carbon sink that RNG is. So if we look at this graph, what we're pointing out is that per kilometer, grams per kilometer of CO2 emissions, a typical diesel vehicle, and this example is a 7.7 uh, liter diesel vehicle in the European market, emits 663 grams per kilometer. And that's kind of the baseline to say, okay, we need to get better than, than that, and we need to get better than that quickly. If we were to take a look at the two green bars, of RNG, renewable natural gas. The first one is about an 80% reduction in emissions, and that's biomass that's derived from agricultural waste, wastewater sludge, landfill. If we take a look at the best case scenario, and that is uh, RNG that's derived from manure, it's as much as a 200% improvement over diesel today. And in fact, if you compare it to the EU electrical grid today, which is partly coal fired and, and other clean sources, it's even better than that and even better than green, green hydrogen in the future. So in front of us today, we have a very viable solution, renewable natural gas with a, a serious negative sink, uh, carbon sink that allows us to get to that 2025 target of 15% reduction in transport and the 30% reduction that we have out in 2030. Now the question is, is there enough? Can we supply enough of RNG to support the European truck market. 
So a term I'm going to introduce is exajoule. So if we're to look at the transport segment in the European market, it requires about four exajoules of energy per year to transport goods based on the route miles performed. If we're to look at available biomass globally, there's approximately 31 exajoules of biomass available uh, on a global basis. If we look at the European market specifically, we have availability of six exajoules of biomass, and that would be all, from all forms. And about 80% of that is relatively easy to get to, 20% is a little tougher, 50% would be agricultural waste, wastewater, landfill, and then there's another 20 to 30 percent that is that is manure that's a little bit tougher to get at, but about 80 percent of that is still accessible, meaning there's sufficient biomass to support the transport sector moving to renewable natural gas. Now we have to fill our vehicles, right? So when we look at deployable technology from now through 2030 and beyond, we have to have infrastructure in place. And Europe has done a fantastic job. Today, there's over 4,000 compressed natural gas filling stations in the marketplace. There's over 450 LNG stations. And the exciting thing about it is we're starting to see countries like Sweden, the UK, the Netherlands, having filling stations that offer 100% renewable natural gas. So for fleets that are really focused on their ESG statements and they're reducing their carbon footprint in those markets, they have the ability to fill their vehicles with 100% renewable natural gas. And if we go back to the prior illustrations and see what a negative carbon sink that is, they're significantly reducing their carbon footprint by adopting that technology. Some of the fleets that are looking at making changes, FedEx, um, Pepsi, Frito-Lay, Amazon, UPS, AB InBev, all of these fleets have stepped up and said, we not only want to reduce our carbon footprint, our consumers and our investors are demanding it. We have to ha reduce our carbon footprint. U UPS has been an example in the North American market of really being serious on their natural gas adoption. They've adopted it across multiple different duty cycles in their fleet, and we're starting to see a lot more fleets take their lead in, in doing the same thing. Let's talk about technology. So this is really important and, and from a hexagon composite standpoint, because we're agnostic, we, we're very consultative with today's fleet globally. We spend as much time talking to fleets as we do talking to OEMs to make sure what we offer is sufficient for their duty cycle. The last thing we wanna do is offer a technology to a fleet, they deploy it and they find out it's expensive, I can't maintain it, I have driver anxiety, they're worried about running out of fuel, they're worried about being safe. So when we look at the available technologies today, BEV, fuel cell electric vehicle, natural gas in its various forms of renewable natural gas, compressed, liquid, and then diesel. Diesel is the baseline today. You get sufficient range, well over 2,000 kilometers if required. We look at BEV, and this, is taking, this example is taking a European truck as it is, not modifying the length, not shortening the trailer, saying the European truck as it is in heavy duty long haul is limited. You're limited on how much energy you can package on that vehicle. Fuel cell, same situation. You're limited. You're up to about 400 uh, kilometers range if, in fact, you're at that 36 kilograms of hydrogen on board. Now, we can absolutely do more in the BEV space by putting more kilowatts on the vehicle, maybe make some modifications to the vehicle or the trailer, but we can absolutely achieve mileage of our kilometers of 500 or more, but you're really getting into significant cost up front on battery packs. You'd have to add an additional 300 kilowatts in this example that, to achieve that. Same with fuel cell. We can package more hydrogen on the vehicle. It comes at great cost up front. And in this case, you'd need an additional 54 kg of compressed hydrogen gas. When you look at natural gas, natural gas has near diesel-like range and in fact, now looking at technology that can almost match diesel range in the marketplace. You've got infrastructure that's in place. You have the ability to reduce driver anxiety on fill and off route miles for the fleet. Now we have solutions that can be immediately deployed as these other technologies and infrastructures come online over the years. Corroborating our story around natural gas and the importance of it, recently in North America, Cummins has announced the launch of their 15 liter natural gas engine for the heavy duty space. And this really unlocks 250,000 trucks that didn't have access to heavy duty uh, natural gas engine solutions. We're very excited about that. But when we jump over back to Europe, 
Scania recently announced the introduction of their 13 liter heavy duty engine for long haul transport. Looking at that transit market, there's about a 30 to 40,000 uh, transit and coach market in the European market on an annual basis. Now we can go after those long haul transit routes with a natural gas solution that today is dominated by diesel. So, can we get it from an OEM? Is this a bespoke technology? Today, there's over 100 factory solutions across a multitude of different use cycles, heavy duty truck, refuse, bus and coach, medium duty, all available as factory installed solutions, factory warranted solutions. Over 15 different OEMs offer a wide variety of product. And in the European market, you have leaders such as Scania and Iveco that have uh, natural gas solutions for heavy duty truck. Almost all of the OEMs have solutions for natural gas on the bus side of the business. Volvo has their HPDI, uh, which is a high pressure diesel injection. So there, there's good applications in the European market and a global basis available from the OEM. Now, when we take a look at what the market's saying and, and how do we forecast and what could the potential be from now to 2030, knowing that we have very, very aggressive emission targets to get to, this is a study that was done, part of it was done by NGVA Europe, where we looked out to 2030 and said, what do we think the natural gas park could be in Europe in 2030? And the projection at the time was about 200, just under 270,000 units. There's a study by Oakland's Institute that had a low through high that went anywhere from 44,000 up to 408,000 vehicles in 2025 already. But the most exciting thing to take place is, is this summer, the EU Parliament commissioned a study as they look at RED3, and Ashley's going to talk about that more with you, looking at what they should do from a technology standpoint to hit these 2030 targets. And they, this independent study came back and said, we believe that natural gas vehicle park in 2030 could be in a low case scenario, 675,000 vehicles, and in a high case, uh, sorry, 475,000 vehicles, and in a high case, 675,000 vehicles, exceeding even our, our, our highest projection at, with NGVA. So we're very excited to see that the EU Parliament study is coming back and saying, we need to adopt natural gas. We need to take advantage of the benefits of biomethane and renewable natural gas. So with that and talking about regulations, I'd like to turn it over to Ashley out in Costa Mesa, California. <laughs> Thank you very much, Eric. Um, so I wanna provide kind of, before I jump into what the Fit for 55 and the scope of it and what that proposal actually means, I wanna kind of give us some context um, for what regulations affect natural gas. So we've all heard of the European Green Deal. Um, it was adopted in 2019 and it is the proposal to make Europe the first climate neutral continent by 2050. That was um, kind of codified from a legal perspective um, by the European climate law, which basically made the European Green Deal law a binding commitment for Europe. And then we have Fit for 55, which is the set of legislative tools that are, that are going to deliver on the target in the European Green Deal. So what does Fit for 55 include? It does address the CO2, and I'm gonna deep dive on, on some of these in the following slides, but it includes CO2 emission standards. It includes the Renewable Energy Directive, and it includes the Advanced Fuel Infrastructure Regulation. What it does not include is, the, um, heavy, is regulating the heavy duty sector, meaning it does not include the um, heavy duty fleet emission reduction regulation, which we will talk about. It also does not include the EU taxonomy, which is happening in the background. It was um, adopted. It, uh, it, it was adopted in June of 2021 and qualified RNG as a mitigating technology. So those are happening in the backdrop that we can't forget as we deep dive into Fit for 55. So the CO2 emission regulation. This is, is part of Fit for 55. It was proposed um, along with the other components of Fit for 55 back in July of 2021. And this is, the, I think, the primary tool um, aimed at achieving EU's goal of net carbon emissions by 2050. Now, this is also the source of the kind of doomsday scenario for the internal combustion engine. This is where that, that rumor is coming from and, and what does it exactly mean? So it, re, it does require a reductions target of 55% for passenger cars by 2030 and 50% by 2030. And then the, the kind of the bigger goal is a reduction of 100% that target for passenger cars and light commercial vehicles by 2035. 
However, notably missing from this is the heavy duty sector. The medium and heavy duty sector is not part of this CO2 emission regulation. So this is limited to um, passenger cars and light, uh, light commercial vehicles. Um, also part of Fit for 55 is the Renewable Energy Directive. This was originally called RED, RED 1, RED 2, was originally adopted in 2014. It was revised in 2018. And in, in the current version, the RED 2 establishes an EU overall target of for renewable energy sources of 32% by 2030. As proposed as part of the Fit for 55 package, that target is increased to at least 40% by 2030. Um, also for the specific to the transport sector, um, under, the, uh, under the current rule, RED2, um, it's a target of 14%. And then they changed the metric. It's a greenhouse gas intensity metric as proposed right now. Um, and they put it in place a target of 13%, which is actually a doubling over the prior methodology. And from an EU um, investment perspe perspective, this, um, this target, this renewables target is considered a game changer um, as proposed in the Fit for 55 package. So again, the, um, within the scope of Fit for 55, the Advanced Fuel Directive, Infrastructure Directive. Uh, so previously, this was um, adopted back in 2014, actually. So it's been in place for several years. Um, it requires um, a 400 kilometer uh, fueling, refueling station every 400 kilometers for LNG and um, a, a station every 150 kilometers for CNG. Now, under the Fit for 55 package, the LNG target is retained. However, they have removed the target for CNG. Um, and there's some logic here that the, the, um, the further um, infrastructure for CNG is not needed. Um, and then they're maintaining the LNG target specifically for the heavy duty sector. Um, but I think that the takeaway here is that the build out of natural gas infrastructure continues um, and that, that the Fit for 55 proposal has actually acknowledged that heavy duty sector, primarily the, in the LNG space, um, will, will continue through 2025. So what isn't in Fit for 55? And this is the heavy duty fleet emission regulation. This was adopted in 2019. This includes, so this is the, um, the only target that actively currently applies to OEMs and it requires a 15% reduction by 2025 and a 30% reduction by 2030. This is a tailpipe based approach, which, which we will talk about a little bit, but the, we would prefer in, in the natural gas space um, a well-to-wheel analysis, which is more of a life cycle analysis. So as we move through the regulatory process, that's something we all want to be encouraging. The tailpipe just looks at what comes out of the tailpipe. Um, but this does include an incentive to uh, mechanisms to incentivize adoption and penalties for exceedances. However, this is going to be subject to review in 2022. Uh, and then the proposal, so there, the commission is going to review and um, prepare a report on the efficacy of this rule since 2014, or excuse me, since 2019. And then they're going to propose a new regulation. This is independent of the Fit for 55 package. Um, it, we, it could kind of what this analysis may include and what this proposal may include. It could include targets for 2030, possible targets for even beyond that, 2035 and 2040. As Eric mentioned previously, right now this is limited to certain classes. I think it's four, five, nine, and 10. It could expand that to include other types of vehicles. And most importantly, it could impose a renewable fuel target or goal. Um, the, the new proposal is not expected until 2035, but this is the, the kind of takeaway here is that this is a different unique program for the heavy duty and medium duty sector that is, it, that is different from the Fit for 55 package. So the next 25 months are crucial. Wrapping this up, fleets in record numbers are already deploying natural gas vehicles. They are commercially avail available on the road and they can source, they can be run on and utilize um, methane source from renewable sources. So all we encourage you as you, as you listen today to be, um, be engaged in the regulatory process to help shape this heavy duty emission regulation and also to promote that well to wheel versus the tailpipe to promote that well to wheel life cycle analysis. And as an industry, we believe at Hexagon that is key. There's a lot of people that don't know about this technology, don't know how available it is, how um, the, the carbon negative footprint that it can offer. So we encourage you to be um, proactive in educating 
um, the industry and, and regulators over the course of the next 24 months. And with that, I will turn it back to Eric to kind of wrap this up. Yeah, thank you, Ashley. So to wrap it up, you, the belief that we have at Hexagon Group is that a technology has to be viable at the fleet level, meaning the fleet can deploy it. And if we look at this as, a, as sort of a checklist and what RNG does, first off, there's no supply constraints. We've already determined that there's a sufficient supply of biomass in the, in the European market to be produced into renewable natural gas. That does not mean it's readily available for the grid today, but there's the ability to access that. And just to put some numbers around that, 65% RNG supply potential required for 100% of the commercial vehicle transport. So we wouldn't have to biodigest all of the biomass, just 65% of it to cover all the needs. But if we get a little more realistic and say, okay, we're not gonna adopt fully RNG across the entire transport sector, less than 10% of the biomass would have to be produced into RNG to supply 15% of road transport today that does a significant job that would be negative 80% reduction to 200% depending on the source to help us get to those 2030 targets. So less than 10% into the grid would assist in doing that. If we look at the highest carbon abatement, there is no doubt that RNG off of manure at a 200% reduction in carbon emissions uh, per kilometer is by far even better than hydrogen and EV on today's grid, better from a well to wheel standpoint. And that's an important piece that Ashley just mentioned is the well to wheel calculation versus the tailpipe. When we look at the cost, we're seeing numbers out of the fleets today at a minimum 15% improvement on natural gas versus diesel. When you look at diesel vehicles and the after treatment systems that are required today to allow them to get to today's emission standards, let alone Euro 7 and beyond, we're seeing a 15% re reduction in the overall TCO to the fleet. And then importantly, is it's a mature technology. This is a technology from a natural gas standpoint that is available today. It's available within the OEMs, meaning you can get a factory installed um, application that is warranted by the factory to deploy in the fleet. So as we look at this, Jens, and I throw it back to you in Brussels, we're very excited about what we're seeing in the European market, the growth rate that we're seeing in the European market. Um, we expect that as much as 10,000 uh, natural gas trucks will go into the marketplace in 2021, and as many as 2,500 to, to 3,000 transit buses and refuse vehicles. So with that, I'll throw it back to you in Brussels. Thank you, Eric. Uh, thank you very much for this uh, really excellent introduction and uh, wrapping up all the facts and figures that we have collected or your team has collected. Really excellent. I would like to, to, to make one first comment. And I'm in this, in this uh, topic since nearly 20 years and scientists and engineers are always questioning themselves uh, am I still on the right path? And uh, when I hear now this information, I have to say, I heard this 15 years ago from the F Swiss uh, University Zurich or the Empire Institute. I heard this from Fraunhofer Institute. Uh, I, I've read this in, in uh, uh, really tons of, of scientific uh, papers that it's the best way to reduce carbon dioxide emissions by replacing diesel fuel with methane, preferable biomethane, of course, to be even carbon negative. This is, uh, this is something I read really uh, 20 years ago in a, in a study made by the Swiss and, and I'm still excited that we are on the right path and now it's the right time. Uh, if we don't, uh, don't use it now, when then? Now it's the right time to, to emphasize this, especially when looking at 2022 and the upcoming CO2 legislation for, for, the, for the truck fleet. Well, our topic is today, business talk, Jens talks business. And um, I would like to, to ask you, uh, Eric, some, some questions. And um, um, as you know, I have also a, a long history in the, uh, in the vehicle industry and uh, what's challenging, challenging right now. And I know this is bothering ma many uh, top managers in many European uh, uh, or global, global companies how to deal with the um, um, with the challenges we have ahead and how to change the business. You are uh, active on energy storage, but you are not putting all eggs into one basket. You are providing, you are offering several um, um, technical solutions. Um, 
I, I'm always asking myself, how do you achieve to get the right product for the market? This is in these transitional um, uh, um, eras or phases, not that easy, easy. How do you do this just as a benchmark for others? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question, Jens. Um, and we spend a lot of time doing this and in, in going back to what I said earlier, you know, we spend as much time probably talking to fleets and that is talking to the end users, talking to drivers, understanding what do they need to do their routes, whether it be a medium duty package car delivering product from a distribution center to a home, where there be a long haul application going from, you know, Paris to Berlin, uh, hauling heavy goods. Each duty cycle is very different and each fleet's need is different, not to mention each geography is different. You have different fuel sources available in different areas, different infrastructure in place, whether it be um, natural gas grids or the EV grid. So we really look at the type of fuel for our geography, but going back to our approach and, and what we do. So taking that fleet information, and we have over you know, 15 years of experience talking to fleets, taking solutions to OEM saying, based on our data that we've collected, we know there's an issue when you try to deploy this clean technology and we think we can solve it. And it always comes back to energy, right? How do you store the clean energy in a very efficient manner and type four composite cylinders are without a doubt the most efficient way of storing gaseous uh, energy from a, from a weight, save, weight standpoint and weight equals waste. So if we can take weight out of a vehicle, we improve the mileage, we improve the efficiencies. But also another core competency that we have internally is saying, I'm gonna take these cylinders, these type four cylinders, and I'm gonna package them into a very efficient solution that's gonna solve the needs. Now we've gone from saying, I understand the fleet and what that fleet's needs are and what they're trying to accomplish, but then there's an OEM that has to offer that product, right? And typically there's very limited engineering resource to do that, so we try to solve as much of that on our side as we can to say we'll package that in the smallest possible space and the lightest weight to give you a solution that you can deploy in mass. And then the third thing is, it's got to be cost effective. If we do science projects, they'll de be deployed as science projects. So we're very vertically integrated from winding our own cylinders in-house in multiple different continents, taking that, those, that product, trying to be as close to the manufacturing location as we can to take waste out of the supply chain so that we can offer a product that the OEM can now say, we heard your feedback from the fleet. The fleet is telling us the same thing. Now we're going to deploy that solution. It's been very, we've been very successful with that in both Europe and North America. And Jens, let me just interrupt for a second and say um, to our viewers, our listeners, that um, please remember that you too can participate in the discussion to please use the um, Q&A field underneath the screen to send your questions in. Yes, very good. Um, uh, Eric, please please uh, allow uh, another question. Um, one, one challenge I would assume is that it's not easy in this transition phase to do a profitability calculation. I know this from my experience uh, uh, in, the, in the vehicle industry, but in this transition phase also sales uh, pros prospects are kind of uh, 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 unstable or unsecure. How you deal with this? Do you do uh, just project-oriented uh, uh, profitability calculation? How do you do the business cases here, just in general, not, 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 not in detail? Yeah, and, and it varies on the technology. It's a great question. It varies on the technology that we're looking at. If it's a, if it's a technology that is ready to be, to be deployed in mass, it's a bit of a different calculation. We, then yeah. we really understand the fleet usage pattern to say, okay, can this be adopted in mass? Can we support this for the foregoing future? Some of the other technologies that are more emerging, um, it becomes very much project-based in that we're looking at the specific project, say, what is our end goal? What are we trying to get to? And maybe it doesn't pencil out from an from a ROI standpoint right up front, but we know what our desire is from an emission standpoint or a usage pattern, and maybe even the infrastructure is not there. But, but we'll go ahead and launch a project knowing that the short-term ROI, and we're very transparent with fleets and OEMs when we do that sort of work to say, we know that we have a technology for you today that is suitable for deployment in mass. It is, let's face it, it's gonna be natural gas in one of its very forms, whether it's renewable natural gas, uh, compressed natural gas. But in the meantime, we can look at other technologies and there it very much says, okay, we understand what we're trying to solve and whether we can deploy electric technology, pure BEV, 
or a hybrid technology or fuel cell technology, then it becomes more project based. But even some of those are getting to the point now where we're saying, okay, we're ready to deploy those in mass, regional hall applications where infrastructure is in place. And we're starting to do that in the United States and to a certain extent in Europe on hydrogen in, in the bus market. We're seeing those deploy what was five years year ago science project is today now saying, okay, we have to scale. Now we have to scale to cost us because it's going from project to serial production. Very good, very good. And uh, you, you just mentioned Eric, um, and I have to say in advance, I'm really impressed. Uh, I did not know this uh, before that Hexagon is really active in many global markets. We are today discussing about Europe and the Fit for 55 package and the upcoming legislation. But Europe, Europe is the one thing in general, Europe is has many technological uh, um, uh, proposition or possibilities, but is also focused on, not focused, but has to take into account that we are exporting our knowledge and we have to cover all global markets. And once again, there's no, no uh, single solution for all global markets. How do you see the opportunities for renewable natural gas also in markets outside of, of, of Europe? How do you see this? We think it's a fantastic opportunity. We're seeing it emerge in, in Latin America and in Asia for the European OEMs that are very sophisticated. When you look at the European market, there's, there's an excellent electrical grid. Deploying hydrogen in the North American market and the European market will probably come first in the world. But you look at some of the other emerging markets where we deploy uh, natural gas technology in Latin America, it's an excellent opportunity for, for operators such as Scania and Iveco that have really embraced natural gas in the European market to say, how can I take my product to these markets in mass to deploy the technology that I'm having great success with in Europe? So a superb opportunity for these European OEMs to project their product into other markets as they adopt even the new technologies such as EV and hydrogen beyond 2030. So we think it's an excellent opportunity. We'd love to see more OEMs in the European market in the truck space, especially the, the heavy goods transport, offer those natural gas and renewable natural gas solutions. And it's a, the world is their oyster, so to speak. And you look at those third, third merging markets, that's where you have issues with electrical grids that, that EV is probably gonna be delayed. Hydrogen, getting it there, green hydrogen is gonna be a bit delayed. So you're going to have an extreme extended life of the natural gas solutions in those markets. Um, I would also just add on that front. So we're coming off of the, CO, the, the COP26 that just ended, and there was this huge, um, this global methane pledge where over 108 countries committed to reducing methane emissions by 2030. And I think that in and of itself is going to be a huge driver in the uptick of renewable, of renewable gas globally. These opportunities, these countries haven't, really focused on on methane capture um, and putting that energy into the grid. Um, so I think the opportunities coming out of that in the United States alone, um, with Biden's new redu uh, methane reduction plan, they're targeting 70% capture of methane from landfills. They're encouraging um, farmers um, to to uh, generate renewable gas within their own on their own um, land and put put that into the grid. So I think globally, we're going to see as a result of this COP26, we're going to see increased opportunities. I mean, as as Eric said, that the opportunities are really endless. Um, and I think for emerging markets, that is, it'll be a new um, emphasis on on what what type of renewable uh, gas can come out of those those different areas. Yeah, excellent. But by the way, by you, while we are talking about global prospects, did you know that Europe's biggest biomethane producer is very active in North America and in India and is solving also uh, um, issues regarding the environment? I find this really worth mentioning. Uh, and, and our truck manufacturers are offering uh, the, uh, the products that, uh, that make use of this. And if I can well, um, there's another topic I find very interesting when I look at Hexagon. You do not, I said, you do not put every egg into one basket and all, all politicians, and I hope some, some politicians are all also listening to our discussion. They have understood that Europe has to do much regarding digital technology. We are not really at the forefront uh, on this field, mechanical engineering. There we have strong assets, maybe not really on all fields of digitalization, but this is something Hexagon is active on. And this was interesting. Can you tell us something about this? Sure, sure, yeah. 
A few years back in the United States, we launched a technology called Blue IQ, and it's really when we looked at our technology to try to solve some of the issues that new adopters had. One of, one of the big ones was range anxiety by the driver, by the fleet saying, do I have enough fuel? And at the, in, in that time, natural gas systems, it was difficult to calculate how much fuel you had in the system. So we launched uh, an electronic technology working with the engine partner to say, how can we solve that to accurately assess how much range you have in that vehicle? Recently, we have acquired a company called uh, Hexagon Digital Wave, and what that's gonna mm -hmm. allow us to do in the very near future is in our systems, integrate digital technology that allow us to assess the life of the system, to assess the performance when you're in a fill event, how can we optimize the fill of the particular vehicle that we're looking at? How can we understand what's going on with the system? Is there maintenance required? Is there, has there been an impact event where we need to take a look at a system? So it's gonna allow us to live stream digitally, have fleet awareness of the fuel system that they have, whether it be compressed natural gas solution or a hydrogen solution, which is at even higher pressure, allow us to monitor the systems. Also, from an ESG standpoint, it'll allow us to extend the life of the system. So our systems in type four composite can have a life of 20 plus years. It'll yeah. allow us as the vehicle gets to end of life in eight to 10 years to assess the, the quality and the integrity of the tanks and say, okay, they can live another 10 to 15 years and redeploy those on a new asset. So we're really trying to say, not only do we want to employ the technology to make it more user friendly, fleet friendly, but also how can we reduce our carbon footprint by extending the life of the system, even well beyond the life of the vehicle. Excellent. Well, we, while we are discussing uh, about Europe, it's always good to take a look uh, at the other side of the uh, Atlantic uh, to do a benchmark. And uh, maybe you can tell us something more regarding uh, markets, uh, the market over there in, in, in the United States and also regarding le legislation. What, what did the United States do in order to bring this forward as a benchmark and as a best practice also for our European politicians here? Would you like to tell us something about this? I'll take the first part of that and then I'll kick it over to Ashley. Um, just, just from an adoption standpoint in the, in the North American market, truck, although the truck market is very large from from a volume and a revenue standpoint. It's still only 2% from a natural gas standpoint. So we have a lot of room for growth. And the European market is actually growing three times, the European truck market, three times as fast as North America because the OEMs have really embraced natural gas technology led by Aveco and Scania. Um, but when we look at the North American marketplace, uh, two segments that have really adopted natural gas. One of them is being the transit, but one of them is the refuse sector where you have customers like waste management that have well over 10,000 compressed natural gas vehicles in their fleet. And they've really been a leader understanding there's something going on here with this renewable natural gas. Five years ago before the globe really realized that we can take waste. I think one of the best quotes I ever heard was from a waste management executive said, the whole world has a garbage and waste problem. <laughs> the whole world has a pollution problem. It makes yeah. perfect sense we'd use this waste to drive our vehicles. And they've got yeah, a business Eric, model. Seven billion, seven billion human beings are producing that much waste. We have to make use of this. This is a resource. <laughs> Absolutely. So that renewable yes. natural gas, I'll throw it over to you, Ashley. The, that renewable natural gas has really been a game changer in how we've issued RIN credits. And I'll throw it over to you, Ashley, to explain a little yeah, bit about Yeah. Um, so the U.S., I think, has been very um, novel in its approach to encouraging RNG adoption. And essentially what happens in the U.S. and I think is, is beginning to be modeled in Europe as well, is that environmental credits are generated when RNG or renewable natural gas is used as a transportation fuel. So, and then the, the credits are transacted between producers, brokers, and, and what are called obligated parties um, to reduce the carbon intensity of the fuel pool. So this is done in a couple different ways. We have renewable identification numbers, which are called RINs, which is the mm -hmm. federal level, um, and they're environmental credits and they have financial value. It's considered kind of the currency of the, this environmental credit system. And then um, in California specifically, where I'm located, uh, we have the low carbon fuel standard. It's very similar to the federal program. It's just tra traded within California, but it is a commodity. These are these have value um, depending on demand um, and, and they can become very valuable over time. And essentially what happens is that after RNG is dispensed into transportation, the credits are generated and then monetized by selling to a buyer. 
so if you picture like kind of how this journey works, right? You start with a feedstock or a manure or food waste that's converted into natural gas. Then it is um, injected into the pipeline and it's uh, in, and eventually put into a, a vehicle. The, as soon as it is transferred to a fueling station, the RIN, the credit is created and then it is later retired and that fulfills a renewable volume obligation for either, a, typically it's a, a importer of fossil derived natural gas. So it offsets that carbon footprint through this, this RIN program. Um, another concept that's important to talk about is displacement, meaning that if the, um, the, natural, the molecule of, of renewable natural gas is put into the grid in Indiana and it's used in California, it's that one-to-one -one displacement that, can that, that still generates that credit. So that credit can be used despite it not being the exact molecule that's put in on the other side. Um, this has been kind of, and that I'll, I know I've, I could talk about this for a long time, but um, it's, it's been a very successful, successful method in the United States. It's, it's encouraged um, utilization of RNG. And we would actually, we're seeing this um, kind of momentum in Europe to create a similar structure. I think um, the UK has done a good job. Germany has a, has a, a process in place. As I understand it, Germany is still domestic. So we're, we're looking to have kind of a similar framework to encourage the use of RNG in Europe as well. I don't know if you had anything to add to that, Eric. Yeah, definitely. Then we have to go away from this uh, tape pipe emission legislation and, and to, to look at the, uh, the well -to -wheel, on, on well-to-wheel basis. And uh, Ashley, you, you probably are aware of the uh, discussion or the, 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 the possible solution we are discussing uh, with politicians in, in Brussels uh, regarding a crediting scheme, a voluntary crediting scheme. Uh, in order to make this happen, to make this successful possible, success story also possible in Europe, right? Yeah, and, and that well-to-wheel that you mentioned, I, I, we perceive that as, a, as an uphill battle. And I think that if, if the, the folks on the line are, that are listening can really engage with that, because I think that would be a real turning of the tides if we can shift that paradigm from the, the tailpipe, which is which doesn't take into the full take into account the full life cycle and shift the mentality to a well to wheel. It would encourage not only the credit system, as you said, um, but just it it um, the tailpipe ignores so much of what RNG can offer. Um, it's it's kind of biased, and and so we need to shift that paradigm as part of this regulatory process. So I, I do encourage people to um, to put that at the forefront um, as they're engaging um, throughout the next couple of years, the next twenty four months. Excellent. And what yes. I would like to add is the fact that uh, that uh, we just talked about uh, CO2 emissions, but we have also harmful emissions. And each diesel vehicle we replace by a natural uh, natural gas or biogas, biomethane propelled vehicle, we do something really good for our air. And this is your, uh, that's what you're saying, clean air everywhere. And I, I like this, 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 this phrase. And Jens, we, we do, do have questions from the audience, so I'm just going to interject so we can get some of these questions <laughs> in there. <laughs> Great. So um, uh, the question that we have actually, I think it's for you, Eric. So um, you talked about supply not being an issue. Why is there so little RNG available for the transportation sector? Is the infrastructure a problem? Uh, the infrastructure in regards to the filling stations is not a problem. So we're, we're we said we had over 4,000 CNG stations and uh, I think 458 LNG stations. Those are all except renewable natural gas through the grid. The challenge is, is getting it from the point of biodigestion into the grid. That is, an, it, that is evolving. So, so that is gonna evolve over the next years. And as we said earlier, I think 17% of the fuel used in the European market is considered biomethane and that's for the transport sector. So that needs to improve and grow and get more of that renewable natural gas back into the grid. Great, and I'm just gonna continue on here if that's uh, great with everybody. To combine electrified trucks, battery electric, with RNG engines seems to be a perfect lowest TCO for heavy duty trucks. What's your opinion? Yeah, so we've, we've done studies. Um, one of our, our lead uh, R&D people did a study a few years back and that's a very viable solution. As you look at EV evolving, one of the big challenges EV has, especially in the heavy duty space, is the grid can't support it. Mm. There's a study in North America that said that one heavy duty truck charging off the grid is equivalent to almost 30 homes, 29.5 homes electric use. So imagine 10,000, 15,000 trucks going onto the grid. However, if you look at a hybrid solution where you have maybe a smaller compressed natural gas engine driving a generator, 
running off of renewable natural gas. Now you have range extender, you have a battery pack in there where you could either do uh, charging off the grid as well, but also have a range extender. There's, there's models that, that works very well. Hmm. And then um, I think this one would be for Ashley or for Jens. Um, do you think that the heavy duty regulations can find a place in the Fit for 55? Oh, uh, Jens can chime in as well, but so I, I actually think they're going to have kind of separate tra trajectories merely from a time frame perspective. The Fit for 55 package is on the ground. It's under review. It has an 18 month kind of timeline, whereas the heavy duty, um, the, that regulation, uh, they still have to undergo a full review in 2022 and then a proposal won't hit the ground until 2023. So I think, I mean, if I had to read the, the tea leaves, I would, I would assume that they'll stay on independent paths which is actually good. That's what we want. We want them to have kind of a different path with different um, emissions targets and goals. Um, but I, I'm interested also in, in Jens' view. <laughs> oh, um, my view in this case is the following. Um, it's correct. We have the uh, big discussion next year with the, with the truck fleet, fleet emissions. But you have also to take account the, the, um, um, uh, the, um, the impact uh, what's happening on the truck sector might also have an impact on the passenger vehicle sector. Right now, we are discussing that we want to get uh, to become a zero emission uh, for the passenger cars. If we um, support uh, CNG and LNG, especially CNG, also in the future, which I really would recommend in order to to have a, a steeper a steeper reduction curve then we keep also alive the cleanest and greenest passenger cars we have in place there and those are the cng vehicles and there uh, many people can come and argue hey, this is old-fashioned stuff i'm fine if we can replace it by, by by a better solution i'm fine but the cng propelled passenger car is definitely the cleanest vehicle you can get you run uh, right now in germany my home country you are running these vehicles uh, with zero emissions, nearly zero greenhouse gas emissions, because we have 80% biomethane in place. So, although the legislation process is different, there is interaction, so to say, an overlap, an interaction. Yeah. And then we have another question. I'm going to try and get two more questions in here. Is it fair to assume that renewable LNG offers the same TCO as RNG? It does. <clears throat> you have the liquefaction portion of that that, that add, does add cost to that. But when you look at the carbon abatement from that, um, typically that'll offset. But there is a slight higher cost to the liquefaction of the renewable natural gas, for sure. Okay, great. And then um, to follow on to that question, um, do you believe other engine manufacturers to also develop RNG engines as the marketplace grows? Yeah, absolutely. And Europe has done a really good job. You know, most of the OEMs have natural gas engine platforms. It doesn't mean they necessarily offer them uh, across their platforms, and it doesn't necessarily mean that they offer them on a global basis. If they have partners in other parts of the world, we would love to see them offer those engines in every single market. The European engines are very, very efficient. Um, and and like, as I said, Scania and, and Iveco have been leaders in the European market with heavy duty uh, transit applications in natural gas. Uh, MAN, Daimler, Solaris, all of them have uh, natural gas solutions as well in the transit space only. So we'd love to see them open up their nat gas engine platform across all platforms. Great. And then I think just as a last question from the audience here, since I got several similar, what does it take for OEMs and end users to adopt the RNG technology to a much larger degree? Fleets need to demand it. And we had great success in the United States where fleets come in and say, we want to reduce our carbon footprint. You have a solution that's readily available. We need to see the demand at the fleet level. And we're starting to see that in Europe. Mm -hmm. it's, it's really exciting to see Europe go from almost no natural gas, heavy duty transport trucks four or five years ago to approaching 10,000 now. So the, so the growth rate, is, we need more fleets to do it. We need renewable natural gas. We need the regulators to do the right thing we need well-to-wheel -well calculations on this. We need renewable natural gas as part of uh, the mitigating technology going well into the future. Thank you. I think then I'm going to pass this back to Jens to round it all off um, for the, today's uh, first episode of Jens Talks. <laughs> Yes, uh, thank you, Karen. Thank you, Eric. And thank you, Ashley. This was uh, very inf uh, informative, I hope, also for the audience. I would like to, to make a short summary. Um, we see that uh, Hexagon has very interesting high-tech solutions, 
made in Europe, made for the planet, for the earth, for several markets, for global markets. I think this is this is uh, worth mentioning, and also that it's not just uh, about uh, uh, CNG tanks made of carbon fibers. All digital solutions are there, so that there is a further development possible, and also hybridization for the heavy duty sector is a real opportunity we would keep in place. Then um, we uh, we found out that there is enough really enough um, uh, biomethane or let me say raw material available from a global perspective enough to replace diesel fueled uh, trucks by uh, biomethane trucks and um, have an instant effect of, of, uh, of greenhouse gas emissions and the, uh, um, uh, the um, uh, infrastructure is also there in, in Europe should be expanded we should not stop there uh, which is will be dealt by the uh, AFID or AFIA, and uh, this is to to uh, to summarize this. This is a no regret solution in order to decarbonize transportation because once we want to get rid of the ICE, let's say in two thousand forty or two thousand fifty, we might make use of this. Uh, these solutions also in the maritime sector, sector that we did not touch here. So there are hard to abate uh, areas where we can make use of these technologies. And so this is really a business opportunity. And at the end, if something is not viable and not profitable, it will not make sense on the long run. And this is why we should make use of existing technology and solutions in order to, to keep our planet uh, cool and clean and uh, and the air breathable, clean air everywhere. <laughs> Fabulous. I think yes. That... Um, and now I would like, uh, uh, Karen, I would like to thank you for uh, all this presentation. I, uh, thank you to the audience. Uh, and uh, we see us soon with our next Jens talks. Many thanks. Thank you. Thank you.